Hi, I'm David Wise. I have a background in farming in Western Montana. I have also a background in food safety consulting. And I want to give you a brief overview of our video series. And that's going to be talking about primarily GAP, which is good agricultural practices. And I also want to just give you a brief overview of FISMA, which is the Food Safety Modernization Act, because it also pertains to food safety. So I want to go over the history, the compliance levels, uh, the current management managing agency, and just give you a resource for more information if you have any other questions. So the history of FISMA, which again is, is the Food Safety Modernization Act, it was, uh, it's housed under the FDA. In 2011 was the original proposed rule, and in 2016 they passed the final produce rule, which applies to vegetable growers across the nation. It's a federal regulation. It's housed under the uh, FDA, as I mentioned. The compliance levels are mandatory, qualified, exempt, and de minimis. And again, the, the FDA website is a great resource for this, but I'll just touch briefly on mandatory, which is over a certain sales threshold. Uh, qualified exemption is if you have under a certain sales threshold and you sell to a specific buyer set, uh, things like that can provide you with certain exemptions which reduce your requirements. And then de minimis is if you're under 25,000, you don't need to um, comply with as many regulations, but you do need to consider if you're over that sales threshold at some point. For more information, you can look on the National Center for Appropriate Technology ATRA webpage. Uh, the FDA, I get, as I mentioned, is also a great resource. For GAP, uh, the history, it was the FDA in 1998 uh, put out their guidelines for microbial contamination, and that evolved into what is now under the USDA under the GAP program. The GAP program is entirely voluntary, which means there's no requirement to, to adhere to it, but it is often required by buyers or distributors because it's become an industry standard. The um, current management agency, as I mentioned, is the USDA. For more, more information on GAP, you can go to the USDA website. There's also a great resource on the National Center for Appropriate Technology website on ATRA. So a lot of farmers often wonder if GAP is voluntary and FISMA is a mandatory requirement depending on your sales level, why would I bother to use GAP? And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is it's a national standard. Uh, it's also something that oftentimes you can find auditors under the USDA who do the GAP auditing and they're auditors from your state there's two auditors specifically in Montana where I work. ATRA also has a really great resource of auditors around the country. And those auditors know their state's agriculture and they're able to come to your farm with an understanding of what's going on in your area and they're really easy to work with in my experience. So keep that in mind. Uh, it's also something that's market driven. Like, as I mentioned in the, um, earlier in the introduction, the GAP standard is something that's become a national standard. It's something that buyers and distributors often require because they know it's a, a audited specific level of food safety. Uh, the other thing is it's a, it's a way of developing trust in local food. Something that a lot of people have heard about may, maybe tangentially is, is some sort of food outbreak and the GAP system allows farmers to say we have a system in place for mitigating those risks. You're never going to take care of them entirely but if you have a system of dealing with them it's a, well, a, a great way of developing a trust in your local agricultural system whether that's regionally or just in your own town how, whatever size that you're operating at. The other thing is there's a, a certain frustration level with uh, fe federal regulations that, that are that can be a little bit broad. So for example, in FISMA uh, and as well as in GAP, there's a requirement that you have to mitigate risks of wildlife in your field and that's because of the fecal contamination, uh, also other, other considerations. And some farmers are frustrated when they hear these kind of vague guidelines. But what GAP does is it allows you some flexibility as a farmer to say, okay, we need to, to take care of this potential problem and it allows you to deal with it in a way that is practical for you and your operation. So it's not really explicit. And GAP is really great about giving you enough information so that you can meet the guidelines and have a great sound food safety plan, but also enough latitude that you can take uh, your own way of operating and integrate the GAP system without too much trouble. So keep in mind the GAP system is voluntary, it's not a requirement, but you may have a buyer that asks you for a food safety system or specifically for GAP, and then it's up to you whether or not you comply with that request. If you decide to go ahead and go with GAP, there are a couple step steps you'll take to get to the final audit process. First, you'll want to take a GAP-oriented food safety training program, and then after that you'll want to write a food safety plan which will detail how you're going to implement food safety on your farm in writing, and you'll also create your log sheets where you're going to document all the things that you do on your farm. After that, you'll want to go ahead and score yourself. So that's going to be taking the checklist, which I'll go over more in a moment, 
and you're gonna score yourself and just see where you're at in terms of the audit system. The next step will be an internal audit. That's an optional step. The internal audit will be followed by the third-party USDA audit. And I wanna make a distinction between the internal and third-party USDA audit. The internal audit is gonna be a little bit more informal. It's gonna be conversational, so you're gonna be talking with the auditor about things they've seen on other farms. They're not gonna tell you what to do specifically, but they can have a little bit more dialogue with you. And it's not gonna be something that goes on a permanent record. The USDA audit is gonna be a third-party audit where you have a USDA certified auditor come to your farm and go through the checklist with you. It's the same checklist that you'll have with the internal auditor, but it's going to be uh, a process process that's going to be more formal. They're just going to be seeing whether or not you did things or not and then giving you points accordingly. After that you'll be either certified or not and you'll have a chance to take corrective actions if you need to on that on that final audit. So I mentioned the checklist for the GAP system. That's also the scoring sheet. Those names are used interchangeably. That's what the internal auditor and the third-party auditor will be using to score you and that's what you can also score yourself with. That's available online on the USDA webpage as the GAP audit checklist. And you can go through that sheet on your own, as I mentioned, and 80% is all you need to pass. And you also choose which scopes you will complete in that checklist. So if you look through that checklist, there are certain scopes that deal with different aspects of the farm, like field harvesting and packing, and there's also packing house, things like that, and are divided up by areas of the farm. So keep that in mind and choose which scopes which you'll have audited, and that'll be dependent on your own food safety needs and oftentimes what the buyer requests. As I mentioned, you need an 80% to pass that audit. So if you're close to the 80% when you do your initial self-audit, consider modifying a few things on your farm. So I mentioned you need an 80% to pass. There are also conditions which if the auditor observes them on the farm, it's considered an automatic unsatisfactory, or in other words, you fail the audit. If those conditions exist, and those are things like excessive rodents or employee practices that are obviously endangering food safety, the audit is considered failed at that point, and it's up to you whether you want to continue the audit and learn from the auditor uh, about the rest of your system, or you can stop the audit then and complete corrective actions and then have the auditor come back. Either way, you'll have that opportunity to have a time for corrective actions to be taken, and then the auditor can come back and do an additional third-party audit. So once you decide to go the route of the audit, you'll go ahead and request an, either an internal audit or a third-party audit. The internal audit will again be an optional step, but it's a great precursor to the third-party audit because it is more conversational. You want to talk with either an independent contractor or a company who offers an independent uh, auditing service for the internal audit. If you want to do the third-party audit, that's going to be a USDA certified auditor, and that list is housed on either ASHRA's website through NCAT or it's also on the USDA website. There's a list of auditors that you can check in with there. You'll want to go ahead and establish with them the price for the audit, and that's going to be something that maybe covers the, their travel time and their lodging. You'll want to understand the cost before you get started with this process. If you go ahead and decide to do it based on the cost, you'll send them your food safety plan, a map of your farm that details the layout and the production flow. You'll also send them any other relevant documents that you might think they might need to get oriented to your farm. And the more detail you can give them, the better, because it'll help them come to your farm prepared and reduce the time that they have to spend on your farm. Once they have those documents, they'll do a desk audit where they start to go through the score sheet and score you based on the documents you have in your food safety plan without being on the farm yet. And if you look at the score sheet, there's a policy record and document column. It's the far right column where you'll see P, R, and D. A policy is something that is required to comply to a certain question on the GAP audit checklist, and it's a standard operating procedure. Uh, a D is required for compliance to a question. An R is something that is a record that will show an action has been taken. Once they go through those documents and do the initial scoring, they'll ask you any follow-up questions either by phone or email, however they want to communicate with you, if that's necessary to clarify anything. Once they have a good sense of your farm, they'll schedule an on-site visit with you, and you want to make sure that that on-site visit takes place when all the crops that you want to certify under the GAP program are being harvested. They need the opportunity to view the crops being harvested. They don't actually have to view everything being harvested, but they need at least the opportunity to take a look at all those processes. Once you schedule that visit, they will come to your farm for the on-site portion of the audit, and that will start with an opening meeting where you make sure you're on the same page about what scopes are being audited that day and what crops are going to be observed. 
and then they'll take a walk around your farm with you and answer any questions that haven't been answered on a checklist. They'll probably talk with some employees. The employees don't have to have the food safety plan memorized, but they need to know the information relevant to the tasks that they're performing. Once the auditor has done that, they may ask you any final questions they have for you as the food safety manager. And then they'll go ahead and do the scoring process where they complete the score sheet and see how you've done overall. And again, you need an 80% to, pa to pass. They'll come back and have a final closing meeting with you where you go over anything where you lost points and also anything that was marked not applicable. So there won't be any surprises as far as the scoring. After that, they will leave the farm and they will complete a report. If it's an internal audit, that report will be available to you. It's not a formal report that's available to the public. If it's a third-party audit, that report does go on the USDA website, and it's there for, for example, for your buyers to view if they want to double-check your GAP certification. If you did end up getting too few points to pass the audit, so if you're under 80%, or if you had an unsatisfactory condition observed during the audit, which created an automatic failure, you're going to want to have a time where you take corrective actions, and that's always an opportunity you can take after the audit, and then you'll have an opportunity to have an auditor to come back and do a second audit after those corrective actions have been taken. So in this introductory video, we've gone over what the differences are between FSMA, that's Food Safety Modernization Act, and GAP, Good Agricultural Practices. And we've given you a sense of why you might want to use GAP, even though it is a voluntary process. Also, we've gone over why the internal audit might be a beneficial precursor step to the third party audit because it is more conversational and you'll have a chance to have dialogue about ways to change your farm. Again, you're not going to be told what to do, but given suggestions about options that you have and ways to evaluate the risks on your farm. In the next few videos, we'll go over each scope uh, that's a part of the checklist and give you a sense of how different farms have dealt with each scope. Again, the scopes are things like field packing, packing house, divided up based on the operations on your farm. And you'll get a sense for how the farms have dealt with common challenges, and then we'll look at a couple of common mistakes that can be made for each scope and go over a few specific questions in each area to give you a sense of exactly what the auditor will be looking for during the internal audits.